everybody we're streaming live to Facebook and to YouTube for the first time this year so happy new year to you all from the healing vet which is me dr. Edward the healing vet and today I want to talk about a really um, hot topic and a really important topic when it comes to welfare issues in purebred animals we're going to mostly talk about dogs but a lot of these are just as relevant for cats that have the same sort of um, what you might call selected deformities. So there's been um, some interesting stuff going on in that this week or the last week or two Norway has actually passed laws banning the breeding of Bulldogs and Cavalier King Charles Spaniels and this law has been um, it has been on welfare grounds that this legislation has been um, framed up and that's the reason that these animals are not allowed to be bred anymore in Norway is because of the suffering that these animals are experiencing. Now this has caused a bit of an uproar. There's been um, it's a fairly polarised issue, so on one side of the fence we've had a whole lot of people that have been going, oh, it's, it's terrible, we should ban all this breeding, we should not allow anyone, to, they should ban all these other breeds too, right? And then on the other side, there's been a lot of equally passionate outrage from the breeders who are behaving as if it's the end of the world, um, and that it means that pretty soon there won't be any dogs available for pets at all, and that it means that backyard breeding and puppy farming will explode or they're actually saying that the new laws will make dog welfare worse, which I find a pretty strange sort of argument to be making. But all the same, it's a really important issue and I want to just take a really realistic, sober look at what's going on because there is a middle ground and if we want to save pure breeds, some fundamental things are going to have to change. Um, the truth of the matter is that all pure breeds are genetically doomed without the changes that need to be made and I'll talk a little bit more about that as we move in. And hello to all of you who are watching live, please do say hi in the chat, let me know where you're from, love to hear about you and your animals and if you're watching on YouTube please do click like the channel, join us so that you'll know when we next come up live in your stream. Now there's two factors in play with the, the welfare issues that are associated with purebred dogs. So let's dig into those welfare issues just a little bit. There's a whole lot of different welfare issues and it depends which breed we're talking about. Um, one of the most important ones and the one I'm going to talk about quite a lot today because it's a good example are the issues invariably associated with a brachycephalic or a flat faced head type in dogs. Now this is equally true for cats by the way. This head shape where they have less nose like you think pugs, boxers, uh, Frenchies, all of those kind of dogs that have a squished in nose, squished in flat face, this head shape causes restriction of the airways. Now this is a simplif simplification of a very complex thing which is called BOAS, brachycephalic obstructive airway syndrome. There will be a, a link to the blog that I'll pop in as well that you'll be able to click through to. That's got, you can actually go and have a look at the links for this. Um, BOAS is very prevalent in brachycephalic dogs and cats. So a study has showed that 89.9% .9 of fresh bulldogs tested were affected by BOAS to some extent with 53.9% exhibiting clinically relevant disease. So that is more than half of the French bulldogs uh, are basically kind of partially suffocating the whole time because they can't breathe properly. Now brachy dogs are super popular. The breeds include French bulldogs, bulldogs, boxers, cavaliers, Shih Tzus, Boston, Boston Terriers, Mastiffs, Pugs, Affin Pincher, Brussels, Dog de Bordeaux, Japanese Chin, Laza Apso, Rosaliro, and Pekingese. Now, that's brachycephalic breeds. They're not the only breeds that have big problems in terms of um, welfare issues. So in the Doberman breed, nearly 60% of all dogs will be diagnosed with dilated cardiomyopathy, which is genetic disease in that breed, by the age of eight years of old. 
and it's due to inbreeding essentially or loss of genetic diversity due to the way that purebreds are bred which is that you close the stud book and then you're not allowed to crossbreed with any other kind of dog anywhere else and you can't bring in fresh gen genetics. Um, Cavalier King Charles, Charles Spaniels are also prone to another disease from the skull malformation due to human selection so the humans select the shape that they think is pretty um, and this causes a thing called syringomyelia so essentially the skull becomes too small for the brain and the brain is squished down into the brain stem and the top of the spinal cord the underlying condition is called a chiari like malformation or CM and the inflammation of CM in the Cavalier King Charles breed is estimated at 95% of all of these dogs and current studies suggest that syringomyelia is present in more than 50% of dogs with CM with approximately 35% of affected dogs exhibiting clinical signs. So this means that you've got a lot of Cavaliers that have got a really bad headache in other words to simplify it a bit. Other breeds prone to SM are Brussels, Griffin, Maltese, Yorkshire Terrier, Chihuahua and strangely the Staffordshire Bull Terrier. Cavies are also prone, prone, genetically prone to mitral valve disease leading to chronic heart failure so I'm just sharing a few of the more obvious um, and prevalent problems in some pure breeds. But um, so you've got genetic and inbreeding is, is one of the problems. So you get genetic diseases. And then the second welfare issue is selection for deformed body shape, which are, you know, flat faced dogs, dachshunds with very long backs. Um, things like that. And there's a lot more diseases that I'll just quickly run through, through a few of. Hip dysplasia, OCD, uh, joint disease, developmental joint disease, entropians of the eyelids, subiotic stenosis, intervertebral disc disease, um, dackies are very prone to that, hypoadrenal corticism, atopy, allergic dermatitis, cataracts, epilepsy and portosystemic shunt. And there's in addition to this, there's a whole lot more um, breed-specific genetic diseases, which I don't have time to share all of them right now. There's a hell of a lot of them. Um, idiopathic cocker rage, grey collie syndrome, Sheltie progressive retinal at atrophy, and canine multiple system degeneration, just a few of these. So there's many other breeds that have individual diseases within the breed that is a big problem. So this is the problem, is that we've got all these dogs that are having welfare issues, suffering, disease pain and this is why Norway has has passed this law with Bulldogs and Cavalier King Charles Spaniels which are two of the worst affected pure breeds when it comes to these problems that affect their quality of life and France is presently bringing legislation through their parliament which is going to be a lot stricter than Norway's and going to affect many many breeds so it's um it's a big thing now these animals, we've got a lot of animals that are suffering and it's really down to the behaviour of humans, right? Humans have bred these dogs the way they are, the way that humans have selected um, body types and shapes, all these things are the root of the problem. Now I want to take a really compassionate look at this because it's actually relatively um, easy if somewhat complicated and taking some time and effort to work out how to do it properly to reverse the problems of breeding unhealthy shapes or types of dogs and it's relatively easy to connect the genetic problems as well you have to do some study you have to actually formulate how to do it and be careful but um, it's doable it's very very doable so let's consider the example of brachy dogs to shame, change the shape to make the animals healthier and remove the suffering of Boas, um, you simply have to start selecting for dogs with a reasonable amount of nose in your breeding programs. And I mean, beyond that, you have to go to the breed um, standard and you have to actually change the shape of the head that's allowed in the breed standard so that these animals have a reasonable proportion of nose and muzzle compared to the rest of their skull and their nose is not squished right in flat with huge folds and a complete inability to breathe. So simple in theory but far from simple in practice because breeders and breed fanciers love the type even though it's causing suffering. 
Now part of the reason for this is the face shape of brachy dogs is very similar in proportion to the face shape of a little human infant. Human infant when they're, when they're first born have very similar sort of characteristics. And humans have a hardwired, cute, protect, bonding instinct in response to this actual shape of the dog. So that, that makes people think, oh, this little brachy dogs are so cute and lovely because there's a hardwired instinct in us to see the shape of their head and get triggered an emotional response in us, which is a problem, right? And uh, um, the other thing here is that we then need to talk about the show ring because the shape of dogs in the breed is driven by the shape of dogs that win championships in the ring. Um, people want to win, right? And this is another people problem because people have a lot of emotional and perhaps ego investment in their dog doing well in the show ring. So this leads to a conscious or an unconscious selection bias by the breeders to kind of exaggerate the breed characteristics to the edge of the standards so that then the dog will just pop a little bit more in the ring, stand out a little bit more, be a little bit different to all the other dogs in a, in a, in a way that makes them look more attractive. And then they get the blue ribbon. So the breeds tend with showing and the pressures of showing with this kind of selection pressure from um, confirmation showing and people wanting to win, uh, it is a problem. They tend to creep more and more into an exaggerated shape that pushes the boundary of the breed standard more and more to extremes and this moves the dog further, further, further away from a healthy functional body shape. Now if you want to look at a healthy functional body shape go and Google village dogs. These are free roaming, free breeding, no human selection pressure type of dogs and they tend to have a very functional body shape. They have a head with a good amount of nose, they tend to have a body that can move with, without any um, orthopedic problems, but that's not what dogs in show rings look like. Everyone wants to have a dog that has a special shape that's just the breed shape and this leads to a lot of suffering for a lot of animals. Now to be fair, there has been some movement in um, terms of the breed associations rewriting breed standards Though, look, in my opinion, they're really tinkering around the edges and they have not changed as much as needed. If you look at the breed standards for Bulldogs heads, still, they are totally unacceptable in terms of welfare. You cannot have a dog have reasonable welfare with that head shape, in my professional opinion. It is just simply not possible. So, the in and even in the ones that have changed their breed standards, we haven't seen much change in what types of dogs are winning in the show ring. So there's an entrenched culture in the ring and the judging fraternity that means that there has not been very much real impact on changing the shape of these deformed breeds for the better in, in general. So not until different shaped healthier dogs start consistently winning in the show ring, I believe, will we see real lasting change in the breed shapes. And also, you know, speaking of the brachy thing, we do get um, uh, this brachy creep happening in all sorts of breeds as they come into the show ring. We're seeing it in, um, near, in um, goodness, I think a little Newfoundlands. If you look at the shape of them and how it's changed over the last 10 or 20 years, their whole body shape has become a lot heavier and they're getting the real brachy type face with nose folds and a shorter head. So this is something that happens, seems to be happening as uh, an unintended consequence of showing dogs. So that's a big fat human factor and you know I'm, I'm not wanting to any breeders who might be listening to this to feel attacked because if we attack breeders over this they're just going to dig in their heels and I want to really honour the fact that these breeders absolutely love their animals and have a deep passion for their breeds. And most breeders honestly believe they're doing everything they can to improve the breed. Yeah. So it's, um, I think one of the big problems with, with showing animals is they don't have to be functional to win in the ring. If you have working animals, they have to be functional to be able to do their job. And I would love to see in all breeds of dogs that there be a functional test for all animals that are showing in terms of confirmation. 
Um, got Marie, hi Marie, who's going to start training an assistance dog and she's found a working line breeder. So I'm just checking into the comments here. If you've got any questions or comments, please do say hi. And lots of um, crossbreeding too is not necessarily, in, you need, we're going to talk about crossbreeding in a minute, but um, a lot of the crossbreeding that I'm seeing at the moment in terms of oodles and oodles of oodles is very unintelligent crossbreeding with poor genetics from both sides and you're ending up with making the problem even worse. So then we come to genetics. So one is selection of shape. That is number one big problem in terms of welfare issues for dogs. Number two is the genetics. Inbreeding, lack of genetic diversity. As soon as the stud book on any given pure breed is closed, then that um, breed's genetic fate is doomed in the long term. From this point, genetic diversity becomes less and less every generation, which is exacerbated by line breeding, which is, in other words, inbreeding with intention. Heavy selection to male dogs who do well in the show ring, and perhaps paradoxically, culling animals that have genetic diseases all make this underlying structural genetic issue worse. Now, no amount of um, testing for genetic diseases can cure this structural genetic issue. And genetic testing is the answer that pure breeders, associations and breeders say, oh, we test for our animals, so we're doing everything we can. Um, this is a one-shot solution. This is their sort of solution, but sadly, it's no silver bullet because every dog's genetics that is removed from the population reduces diversity and will cause the eruption of more and more genetic diseases over time. Now, if you want to take a deep dive into the science of this, if you're a breeder and you're interested in um, saving breeds and making breeds healthier, drop into the Canine Institute of Biology because there's an absolute ton of great information there. Um, Sandy says, Dr. Edward, not all the current problems are due to the show ring. There's still a lot of indiscriminate breeders out there unrelated to the ring. When I judge dogs, I am well aware to award for confirmation, health, etc. I have not awarded dogs for obvious issues. Sandy, I'm really, really happy to hear that there are people like you out there in the industry um, like that. And I'd, I'd like to honour that. And I, you're right, there are also indiscriminate breeders out there who are not showing, who are just breeding dogs to sell. That's a problem too. So, but the genetic issues... Um, and I will say, Sandy, too, that the show ring is still a big driver of a lot of these problems because I see breeds going to the show ring and I see their shape deteriorate from a healthy functional shape to an unhealthy, unfunctional shape over generations. Like if I think of just blue, blue cattle dogs here in Australia, they're all healthy, functional, working type dogs and they are not anymore. The show type dogs have become heavy and different shape and not as functional in their anatomy. So the genetic issues can be cured relatively quickly and easily by intelligent crossbreeding to bring in new genetics and then breeding back to type over the next few generations to go back to the type for the breed. Um, now the problem is that the whole philosophy of pure breeding is like canine eugenics essentially in that you must never crossbreed with a breed. It's like the ultimate sin. You should not ever do it. You're ruining the purity of the essence of the breed. Now, this is just a human idea, a philosophy, one which um, many breeders are a little bit fundamentalist about. In fact, that's what the whole pure breed industry is built upon, this idea. And I really believe that pure breeders need to change on this one. Um, there has not been meaningful change. We've known about these welfare issues for a long time, and we are not seeing fundamental meaningful change in the shape and the health of these dogs and breeds, and it needs to happen. And I'm coming to that, Sandy, there definitely are some people making a change. I'll talk about that in a minute too. So I don't want... Um, yeah, so nothing much has really changed in the mainstream, in the majority of the pure breed showing and breeding industry, as is shown by a recent, recent Pekingese that won a grand champion thing, that honestly this thing, its head was really, really, really awful. Um, 
Now, I do want to give a shout out to the, the, the minority of breeders who really are implementing breeding programs selecting for healthy body shapes and intelligently crossbreeding to save some pure breeds that are close to the edge. But I reckon this needs to become mainstream, which is going to mean significant change. And I don't know how we're going to do that because change is uncomfortable for humans. And a lot of these breeders, these beautiful humans who have so much passion and love for their dogs and the breeds they choose, well, um, if there isn't a real action, industry-wide, intelligent, meaningful change that results in changes in the shapes of the dogs, you know, Bulldogs, Frenchies, um, Cavalier, King Charles, Spaniels, I'm looking at you because we need to see really fundamental change in the, in, in the breed, in the whole of the breed, in terms of these dogs having noses for a start. But from the human perspective, if you read this, or if you're listening to me and you do feel attacked, um, maybe just get a bit curious about that because all I'm talking about here is welfare. Uh, making sure that animals are not bred into a shape that causes suffering and pain. Changing genetic strategies so that we don't have a whole lot of dogs with severe genetic disease causing suffering and pain. So how much of your identity and ego might be bound up in what's going on, you know? What unconscious behaviour patterns might you have in play that are stopping you from actually selecting for dogs with noses if you're a Frenchie breeder or a Bulldog breeder. A Frenchie or a Boxer with enough nose to breathe is still a Frenchie or a Boxer and a dog in a breed that has had fresh genetics brought in through crossbreeding to save them. So for instance Dobermans are pretty close to the edge. We're pretty close to losing Dobermans as a breed entirely and they are beautiful dogs. I love them. I love the breed. I love the breed characteristics and the personality of them. But if we don't start intelligently crossbreeding new genetics into the Doberman breed to get rid of the dilated cardiomyopathy genetic diseases, we're going to lose them. So if you can get the breed to the same shape and colour and characteristics while with intelligent crossbreeding, while getting rid of the genetic disease, to me it seems like a really wise choice. Now it takes a bit to do, it's not the simplest thing in the world. You have to um, analyze what's going on with the breed. The Institute of Canine Biology has got a whole lot of information on that, that if you want to do it, um, you can do that. But I, you know, my call out here is let's come together because we all love our dogs and we love particular breeds of dogs. And let's make change. Let's make real change. Let's change the shape of our dogs back to healthy and functional. Let's change the shape of these breeds that are that large, you know, more than half of the su have significant pain and suffering due to their shape or their genetic diseases. Let's get together and change it, you know, because I've got to tell you, um, if you're a breeder or in the breeding industry and you don't do this, you're going to have to because laws are coming that are going to, that are, you know, welfare issues have become so evident that laws are now being brought in to say enough. We will not tolerate dogs with this kind of shape because we know it causes them suffering. And Sandy, thanks for your input on the chat. I really appreciate it. Um, and yes, there are people making change. We just need more of them and to get more active and make it happen more quickly. Okay, thanks so much for the first live session here with the Healing Vet for 2022. I'll be back 